John Travolta is the comeback kid embodied. As a young actor, his star soared higher than most, only to plummet into the obscurity from which few stars rise again. But the handsome blue-eyed charmer amazed everyone with his ability to re-emerge and reinvent himself twice. The resilient actor is talented to be sure, but his capacity to survive through the vicious Hollywood gauntlet has everything to do with his smooth coolness that runs so deep. I think I do cool things, but I don't know if I could label myself a cool other than I, I, like, I like living life in, in a full-bodied way. John Joseph Travolta was born the last of six siblings on February 18, 1954 in Englewood, New Jersey. John's inspiration for acting came from his mother, Helen, who worked as an actress and a high school drama teacher. Performing was also encouraged by John's tire salesman father, Salvatore, who assembled a small theater for his children in the family's basement. Early on, John developed a realistic attitude about acting that has served him well ever since. I was a child actor, so I'd been around it a long time. Mom, sisters, the whole works. So I had a, a great sense of rejection and acceptance as par for the course concept of show business. So none of this concerned me too much. Nicknamed Bone because he was such a skinny teenager, John actually took tap lessons from Gene Kelly's brother. Now, when he was 16, with his parents' blessing, he decided to quit high school and move to New York to live with his sister Margaret and try his hand. He landed some small part in Broadway productions. And then he got the part of Doody in the touring musical Grease. The 21-year-old's first big break came shortly after he came to Hollywood to try his luck in television. John landed the part of the swaggeringly cool but lovable high school hoodlum Vinnie Barbarino in the 1975 hit series Welcome Back, Cotter. Movie roles quickly followed. Travolta showed the real breadth of his acting ability by playing against character in a film called The Boy in a Plastic Bubble. And it was all about a boy who had to live in a germ-free environment because he suffered from a rare and terrible immune deficiency disease. Now, it was during that production that the actor fell in love with Diana Highland, a glamorous actress who played his mother in the film. And the fact that she was actually twice his age didn't make any difference at all. They fell madly in love. I think it's really tempting in our culture to assume that when a young man goes out with an older woman that he's looking for some kind of mother figure. But I think it's also important to realize that when a child is the youngest family member, older siblings and parents are who the child usually hangs out with. And particularly if this child you know, begins a professional life at a young age, it could be a sign of greater maturity that this person is really more comfortable around people who are much older than himself. John took America by storm, once again firing up that cocky cool strut as Tony Manero in the 1977 blockbuster Saturday Night Fever, working stiff by day, disco king by night. Travolta was nominated for an Oscar for his visceral depiction of Tony Manero, and at 23 years old, he was really on top of the world. Only then, his world was to turn upside down. The love of his life, Diana Highland, died of breast cancer in his arms, and she was only 41. By channeling the extraordinary anguish he felt over Diana's death, John went on just the following year to put his energies into the exuberant dancing and singing lead Danny Zuko in the amazing hit Greece, which went on to gross $400 million. And with this tremendous success came another onslaught of tremendous pain. The 24-year-old's mother, Helen, died of cancer in 1978. Well, I think grief can be a real galvanizing agent, and it can inspire us to work. But I think we could also become lost in that work because we're trying to shut out some kind of pain. We may throw ourselves into any role that's come our way in any job. We may just look for any way to blot out that pain and, and perhaps find refuge in overwork. Travolta began his slow but steady descent into second-rate roles and downright flops. The disaster of the movie Moment by Moment churned up extra pathos because its storyline paralleled John's own life. It followed the tragic romance between a younger man played by John and an older woman played by Lily Tomlin. 
In 1981, during the shooting of director Brian De Palma's box office dud Blowout, Travolta began to suffer again from the insomnia that plagued him as a child while he waited for his mother to come home from her late night acting jobs. Ultimately, the faltering actor took a four year break from movies altogether. I think whenever we use some kind of behavioral method to cope with our difficult emotions, so if we throw ourselves into work, if we use some form of escapism, then those emotions are still lying there under the surface. And when we're a child who feels a lot of abandonment because our parents maybe aren't around very much, those feelings will come up again in adulthood. And death is the ultimate form of abandonment. As adults, we frequently revert to coping mechanisms that we used as a child during times of stress. So it seems quite likely that at this period of time, an adult will use some of their behaviors and patterns that were adaptive as a child. John Travolta did eventually start acting again, but he was now entering his 30s and he was still seen as the rebellious young teenager. He couldn't get any decent roles. In fact, things got so bad that the only recognition he got was a Raspberry Award for the worst actor of the 1980s. Travolta made the utmost of his downtime. During the time that I was doing last film, I actually had a chance to go out and enjoy my life quite a bit, too. I traveled the world and I rubbed elbows with all sorts of people and uh, kind of rekindled my purposes for, uh, for doing movies and acting. In 1989, while he was working on the eminently forgettable movie The Experts, John Travolta met actress Kelly Preston, and the two of them really hit it off. There was just one problem, that Kelly was already married. Well, she got divorced and she went on to date George Clooney and Charlie Sheen before she eventually got together again with John Travolta in 1991. And this time it stuck. The two fell for each other passionately. Being an old fashioned romantic, John impressed Kelly with his fancy footwork on and off screen. And the two of them were frequently out on the town strutting their stuff. Well, that's one thing about John. He's living proof that some white people do have rhythm. Well, it's true. He's right. <laughs> John managed to charm Kelly Preston, of course, and they got married in September 1991. The ceremony was performed by a French Scientology minister, and that wasn't apparently legal, so they had to do it all over again with somebody more official. Then, seven months, eight days later, Jet Travolta, their first child, their son, was born, and he was apparently conceived during a weekend visit to the home of Bruce Willis and Demi Moore. While he met with success on a personal level, Travolta's career was still floundering. But then, in 1994, the new edgy director, Quentin Tarantino, was casting his second film, Pulp Fiction. In a twist of fate, Michael Madsen turned down the part of Vincent Vega to appear in Kevin Costner's box office flop, Wyatt Earp. Understandably, Madsen continues to be angry about making the wrong choice. A longtime Travolta fan, Tarantino turned to the largely out-of-work 40-year-old to play the glib and likable hitman Vega. When we come back, Travolta's career is resurrected thanks to Tarantino's nostalgia. I think Quentin has always taken a personal interest in my career, even before he was in a position to help me. I think Quentin has always taken a personal interest in my career, even before he was in a position to help me. I was one of his favorite artists, and um, he couldn't wait to get to a position in his career where he could offer me work in the way that he imagined I should be. The young director's casting choice changed Travolta's life forever. Well, he just allowed me to be the actor that I knew I was, because he trusted me. Any director that lets me go and do my thing, because that's my job, is to me the smartest director. Because if you hire someone like me, you're hiring an unpredictable actor. 
and that's okay. But you just have to, you, you can't try to harness that. Because it's my, my gift to you as a director is to do something different. So let me do it, and Quentin would let me do it. I mean, he let me do things that most directors wouldn't let me do, you know. My whole thing is to give you something different than what you would expect. And Tarantino delivered. The world was used to Travolta as a sympathetic underdog, but the actor was so good at being a bad guy that the Academy took notice of him a second time. I'm enjoying this more than I've ever uh, enjoyed anything. I don't know, I just think I appreciate the idea that it's so difficult to get. I mean, I, I think when I first got nominated, I thought it would happen every year. You know, I thought that, that if I did well, and then 17 years went by, and this is the second one, I thought, okay, this is like, you have to do something really outstanding to get this. It's not just, you know, do a professional job, it's beyond that, so I, I'm more appreciative of it. John did not win the Oscar, but his newfound fame continued. Even the international community recognized the new shine on John Travolta's star. Pulp Fiction won the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival in 1995. We won the Palme d'Or in France. I knew that things would never be the same again. You could feel it. You could feel it in the air. There was a, a seriousness about that movie. In Saturday Night Fever, my performance changed the world. In Pulp Fiction, the movie changed the film forever. So I was part of two very important parts of history. At this point in my life, 10 years ago, it was more important to be part of a film that changed film history because it would keep you in films forever. And I wouldn't be talking to you right now if it weren't for that movie. Travolta attributes his comeback to more than just luck. I think um, stick to the tenacity has a lot to do with it. I think, I think, believe it or not, a somewhat of an ethical life has something to do with it in the long run. May not look like in the short run, but in the long run. You know, if you have trouble with drugs or alcohol or, you know, any kind of addictive thing that could get in the way, you know, I think there are a myriad of ways to get in the way of what you want. You have to have the talent as well to parallel the stick to it and the tenaciousness along with clean. I mean, there's a lot to it to try to, in any profession. I mean, there's not just movies. I mean, you know, let's face it. I think by the time I got my so called comeback with Pulp Fiction, I was ready to entertain again in a very big way and had learned a lot from uh, the time that I was a little more uh, uh, less busy. <laughs> Though he was only paid $140,000 for his appearance in Pulp Fiction, suddenly Travolta was a $20 million man. Offers were pouring in. The streetwise teenager pigeonhole had been blown apart. Much to his surprise, the veteran actor was being offered the parts in action films, often as villains. It's a puzzlement to me because it clearly started after Pulp Fiction, but I would have never predicted it, basically. But after a few movies where it really was making the audience happy to see me in that kind of thing. And it felt like, okay, well, that's that's what you do then when 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 you feel inspired to do so, you know, because it's something that's wanted and needed. I had fun always when I played. In Face Off, I had fun, and in Broken Arrow, I had fun, and I certainly had fun in this. Uh, because they are bigger than life in some ways. Travolta may have found new life in playing bad guys, but this time around, he wasn't limited to one kind of character. Travolta was also well-loved in Get Shorty, playing Chili Palmer, a Shylock-turned-naive movie producer. Well, the only take on Hollywood that I have in common with, with Chili Palmer is probably the idea that I can have it or not have it, kind of take it or leave it. I love it, and I want it, but I don't kind of have a frantic feeling about it. And he's very cool. And I think probably throughout the years I've been very cool about my attitude towards Hollywood. From Vinny Barbarino to Tony Manero to Vincent Vega to Chili Palmer, the transition of mainstreaming John Travolta was completed when he landed the role of the President of the United States in Primary Colors. And when he talks about his role in that film, it's almost as though he's talking about his own career path. It's a nice and honest uh... I think um, assertion of 
the political scene, you know, what it takes to get to the top, and once you get there, you can do something good with it. But on the way, there's some interesting turns that one has to take. Travolta continued to be very successful, although what's interesting is that he managed to turn down a number of plum roles and inadvertently ended up jump-starting the careers of Tom Hanks and Richard Gere. He rejected Splash, Days of Heaven, American Gigolo, Officer and a Gentleman, and Apollo 13. And his reasoning for turning down these roles was rather dubious. I was offered a movie called um, Officer and a Gentleman years ago. And one of the reasons I didn't want to do it is because the guy who only trained to be pilot, he never got to be one. So I was very upset with the whole idea. I was like, well, you mean, I said, can you add a part where he actually gets to fly the jet and he fly, buzzes the school or something? And, and uh, they, uh, you yeah, know, it's about something else. Travolta's new challenge would be to keep his regained recognition as a box office draw. The actor's staying power was seriously tested by starring in and producing Battlefield Earth, a film based on the teaching of Scientology founder L. Ron Hubbard. The $70 million sci-fi action film should have been good, but it sank at the box office and the comeback kid went down with the ship. With ticket sales barely covering the cost of Travolta's inflated salary, Hollywood was having a hard time justifying his enormous fee. Thus began Travolta's second descent into semi-obscurity. Earlier in his career, Travolta had been introduced to the teachings of Scientology, and despite the religion's very controversial reputation, Travolta maintains that the teachings and the spiritual perspective he found really helped to keep him afloat during the wild fluctuations of his acting career. My faith, you know, uh, it, it saved my life, but if, if you needed to find out if I felt like I was given a second chance or something, I was, uh, because I think that people like James Dean and Marilyn Monroe and Elvis Presley didn't make it. And I'm here today. You know, there's a, a, a report on hard copy last night and that before where it has me purchasing a, um, a, uh, a, a, the attempt of purchasing a supersonic jet. And the title was, Stay Tuned to to see about John Travolta's need to have speed of how it could have killed him. Now, could have is the operative phrase there, okay? 40 years ago, James Dean died in a car crash. Marilyn Monroe died of an overdose. Elvis died. But, you know, now they're writing titles about how I could have died, you see what I mean? And I much prefer that. And so, I think I've been given the, the gift of survival, uh, and especially through my religion. When we come back, we find out how Scientology kept John on the straight and narrow. My involvement in Scientology, which is a spiritual-based religion, gave me a, a very distinct perspective on life. My involvement in Scientology, which is a spiritual-based religion, gave me a, a very distinct perspective on life, which carried over into my reaction to show business. So, you know, I definitely had a different feeling than almost anybody did have on, on home. You know, I think it's really important to have a sense of spiritual grounding, particularly in an industry where it's very easy to get lost into how big your last movie was, how much money you're making. And if you have a spiritual connection with a community that sets itself apart from society at large, you can have a movie star, a taxi cab driver, a plumber, all come together to worship, and it doesn't matter anymore. It's a way of shedding your ego and realizing that there is a bond to something greater that keeps one connected and vital. 
On April 3rd, 2000, Ella Blue was born to Kelly and John Travolta. The second-time father had no trouble putting his priorities in place. Travolta reveals some of the benefits of having some spare time on his hands when the movie offers are slow. I spend as much time with my wife and my son as my dad did with me and my mother. Uh, so I kind of have a normal time schedule with my family versus uh, an unusual, which would have been full time, like I did the first two years of my son's life. Spent all day, every day with him and my wife. And that was fabulous, but it was probably unreal because that wasn't the way it was going to be if I wanted to make a living anyway. Travolta admits that he's very overprotective of his children. He loves them madly and he has to know where they are at every minute of the day. In fact, he said that when they're flying on a plane and on the odd times that he's not the pilot, he phones them every five minutes. He has to know that they're safe. And he says that he realizes he's overcompensating because he was so unhappy when he was separated from his own parents when he left home at 16. And you never do an interview with Travolta without him mentioning proudly his children and what they're up to. I'm a dad, you know, and uh, I think that that because the, the case involved children, you can't help but identify with what's happening to these families. I think having your own family, you understand how much love and protection and sacrifice you will do for someone else, you know. Uh, it's a built-in feeling, you know, so it helped me tremendously. If you could imagine, um, you know, wanting to save your own child and that you'd basically do anything. Travolta's strong identity as a glowing family man helped him recover from his second fall from grace and secured his place in the hearts of moviegoers everywhere. The resilient actor's fans were willing to forgive him for the ridiculously overwrought Battlefield Earth. Travolta was welcomed back in heroic, villainous, and familiar roles in movies such as Ladder 49, The Punisher, and Be Cool, the sequel to Get Shorty. Once again, true to his uncanny pattern of bad luck, he let a prime roll slip through his fingers, and once again, it was Richard Gere who benefited by landing the role of Billy Flynn in the Oscar-winning musical Chicago. In spite of another big one that got away, Travolta was rolling in dough. In addition to owning multiple homes, John Travolta is also a fully licensed pilot. And in 1993, he amazed the aviation community who recognized him and really thought that he was a great pilot when he managed to safely land his Gulfstream jet after a total electrical failure in icy conditions. He owned several jets of his own and he bought a Boeing 707 from Qantas Airlines, who he also represents. He loves flying so much that he's fashioned his Florida home after an airport lounge it has its own runway and he can land his plane right outside the door. Well, I lucked out. I, got, I had that with Basic and I had that with The Punisher because they're both Florida movies. So I had the good fortune of being able to fly right into my house and right into the set. Every day. Every day. It was awesome. Travolta's remarkable ability to bounce back comes with his longevity in the acting business. 25 years now of, of being a um, celebrity and, and a fewer, three or four times changing kind of culture pop issues. Uh, I, I guess I'm used to that association or I'm used to that kind of attention so I it doesn't introvert me or, or concern me um, it's kind of fun to think that a movie that you do can influence uh, people too we're getting into the area where I'll be famous more time than I was not famous so if you get the idea that it, it, it's just I probably wouldn't know what to do if I weren't at this point because it's part of like eating and breathing Speaking of eating, John Travolta loves his gourmet food. He does exercise, but he'll do anything to avoid having to slim down, even for a role like Basic, where he had to appear shirtless and very fit and muscular. I went to boot camp. I worked out every day. I uh, was very proud of that. I did my sports, my weightlifting, my running, my uh, diet. No, no dieting. I, I, I stay away from that. I don't, I'm not interested in diet, but... I'm okay with exercise. I mean, I don't love it, but I do it 
because I, I know that my body responds to exercise, so I do it anyway. Father, husband, pilot, and actor John Travolta is an all-around bon vivant. The 50-year-old defines himself by far more than just his career. Armed with a full personal and family life outside of the business, Travolta can weather anything Hollywood throws at him, especially with his good attitude. I couldn't be happier. I mean, the quantity and quality of the offers that are coming my way are better than it's ever been. In any of my reincarnations, this is the best one. And maybe it's because of my age. Just the world knows you've been around a little bit and there's more depth to what you uh, give to a character. Someone's version of a comeback is different from another person's version of a comeback. I'm so tired of trying to figure out what is meant by it. Well, I mean, it's come back again. It's just part of the question. You do believe in it. If one doesn't turn out well, then the next one's considered a comeback. <laughs>